So thanks very much for the kind introduction. It is a you know great honor to be able to give this presentation on our project for this seminar series, and I really appreciate this opportunity and this invitation. So my background is biodiversity conservation, which I think is probably different from most of you in this uh, Zoom meeting today. But for the past 80 years, I have been leading this project called the Translate Project. So th this is the website of our project. So please visit this uh, website if you're interested. But anyway, this project aims to understand the consequences of language barriers in environmental sciences, which is our discipline but more broadly science in general as well. <clears throat> and the part of this project focuses on the importance of scientific evidence that is available only in languages as long as English. So today I will first briefly talk about why including non-English language literature in evidence synthesis is crucial. Then in the second half of the presentation, I will try to explain how we can make a better use of knowing language literature in meta research studies using a case study from our recent paper. So inevitably, my talk today will largely be based on our own research about biodiversity conservation, but I hope you will find the methods we used relevant and applicable to your own research in other disciplines. <clears throat> Yeah, so let me first briefly explain why we can't ignore non-English language literature in meta-research studies. Our, our research showed that there are two major consequences of ignoring non-English language literature in the synthesis of evidence globally. First, by ignoring non-English language literature, we could be losing access to a non-negligible amount of scientific evidence. In this paper published in 2016, we showed that about one third of scientific documents on biodiversity conservation is actually written in languages as in English, especially in Spanish, Portuguese, simplified Chinese and French and so on. So by ignoring non English language literature, we could be losing access to this amount of scientific evidence. And many people often assume that such knowing language studies are diminishing as science is becoming increasingly globalized. But in this study led by Sean Chaudhry, we showed that at least in biodiversity conservation, which is our discipline, the number of publications has actually been increasing in most languages, especially in Spanish, Portuguese, simplified Chinese, Russian, and so on. So contrary to a common perception, the importance of knowing the language literature is not diminishing, at least in biodiversity conservation. <clears throat> and another problem is that ignoring knowing the language literature can cause severe biases in our understanding of biodiversity. In healthcare, it has been shown that more statistically significant results are more likely to be published in English. And this issue is known as language bias in evidence synthesis, more specifically language bias in statistical results, meaning that the nature and direction of a study's results can affect what language it is published in. And we found language bias in statistical results in our discipline, biodiversity conservation too. In this paper, we showed that effect size was hugely different between English language studies and Japanese language studies, also, all these studies were included in the same meta-analysis. And in this case, ignoring knowing language studies would bias the conclusion of meta-analysis. However, a slightly different type of language bias might also exist, especially in ecology and conservation, which is language bias in study characteristics. For example, studies conducted on a local species might be more likely to get published in non-English language journals, as those studies would not be of high interest to international readers. And in our recent work, we showed that language bias in study, study characteristics does exist, having serious consequences for evidence synthesis. So these blue grid cells show the distribution of English language studies testing the effectiveness of conservation interventions stored in the conservation evidence database, which is here. And you can see that English language studies are, unsurprisingly, 
concentrated in certain countries such as the U UK and US and so on. And there is a huge gap in the availability of evidence in other parts of the world, including the most biodiverse regions such as Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Now, when we searched non-English language studies using the same selection criteria, we found a number of relevant non-English language studies in those regions with little information based on English language studies, such as Latin America, Russia, and East Asian countries. And those non-English language studies often provide unique evidence on the conservation of threatened species. Examples include a Spanish language study on endangered Andean mountain cat in Northern Patagonia, and a Japanese language study on endangered, endangered black sons fish owls. So this clearly indicates that there is a systematic bias in study location and species between English and non-English language studies. And by ignoring non-English language studies, we could lose important scientific evidence for those areas and species with little or even no English language study, no English language evidence. However, most of the existing non-English language research is not being used in global level evidence synthesis. In this study, we looked at the proportion of references cited in these eight IPBS assessments on biodiversity by language. For those who don't know, the IPBS is the biodiversity version of the IPCC. Not surprisingly, English language references dominate in most assessment, with on average 96% of the references cited being in English. And this is in clear contrast to the result we saw earlier that 36% of existing conservation literature was actually written in non English languages. And the same is true for more rigorous systematic literature reviews. In this recent research led by uh, Kelsey Hanna, we looked at the use of non English language literature in all the systematic literature reviews and maps published in the journal Environmental Evidence. And we found that only 38% proactively searched for papers in at least one language other than English. And even, even in those 38% of the reviews, most languages searched were of European origin. And for example, no Asian languages were searched, although many of them had a global focus. So this indicates that most of the existing knowing language literature, literature is unused in global level evidence synthesis. In contrast, we also found that knowing language literature plays a very important role in informing local decision making in countries where English is not widely spoken. In this study, we identified national, often governmental reports on the state of biodiversity in countries where English is not an official language and looked at the proportion of references cited in these reports by language. And we actually found a very high proportion of non-English language references in most reports showing yellow and orange here. Across these 37 countries, 65% of the references cited was on average in a non-English language. And as you might remember, this is a stark contrast to the international assessments where only 3.4% of the references are written in knowing languages. This means that by ignoring knowing language literature, international assessments may overlook important knowledge on local and national biodiversity. And this high proportion of knowing language references in national biodiversity reports is partly due to report authors recognizing the importance of knowing language scientific evidence. For example, where we, when, when we surveyed those report authors, 75% of them answered that they cited knowing language papers because they were indeed relevant to their reports. In contrast, only 25% of the report authors answered answered that they cited knowing language papers because they were just easy to understand. So this clearly indicates that in those countries where English is not an official language, knowing language literature is still being used because they indeed provide relevant evidence and not because they are just easier to understand. Okay, so now that hopefully we all know the importance of including knowing language literature in evidence synthesis, the question is how we can effectively synthesize non-English language literature. 
I would say there are three main stages in the synthesis of non English language literature. We first need to choose the languages that are relevant to our study. <clears throat> Second, developing collaborations with native speakers of those relevant languages is the key to a successful synthesis of non English language literature. And this includes recruiting collaborators, providing guidance for collaborators, and training collaborators. And the final stage is obviously actually searching for those known English language literature. So from here, I will talk about the approaches we adopted in our research at each of these three stages. <clears throat> The case study I'm going to use today is this paper where we searched for non-English language literature that tested the effectiveness of biodiversity conservation actions. For this, we screened about 420,000 papers in total, so it's a massive number, and identified 1,234 relevant papers in a total of 16 non-English languages. Obviously, this required a collaboration with quite a few number of people from around the world. In fact, 63 people who are collectively native speakers of 17 different languages. <clears throat> yeah, so first, let's look at how we choose the relevant languages. In this study, we started with these 15 languages listed here. These are the national languages of the 20 highest ranked countries in the World Bank's indicator for scientific and technical journal articles. And these 15 languages also nicely cover most regions of the world. Spanish and Portuguese are obviously the two important languages in Latin America. And French and Portuguese are also widely spoken in many African countries. And we also have, for example, Russian for Russia, and Chinese, Korean, and Japanese for Asian countries, East Asian countries. So we first aimed to cover these 15 languages in this paper, but unfortunately couldn't find collaborators for Swedish and Dutch, which are shown in gray here. And this happens uh, quite often. While we found some promising collaborators for Ukrainian, Hungarian, and Arabic, these three languages. So we opted to include these three languages instead, which was actually even better because we were then able to cover a few more underrepresented regions, namely East, Eastern Europe, uh, West Asia, and North Africa. Anyway, for project synthesizing evidence globally, I would suggest starting with these 15 languages and obviously adjusting the choice of languages depending on the topic. For example, if your focus is on Europe, you obviously need to include more languages from Europe. <clears throat> and after choosing the relevant languages, we need to develop a network of collaboration. Why do we need those collaborators? That is because the biggest barrier to the use of knowing language literature in evidence synthesis is the lack of relevant language skills. Understandably, as we shown in this recent paper based on a survey with authors of systematic literature reviews. Obviously, if no one in your team understands, say, Japanese, it's not going to be easy to search for Japanese language literature. And the most straightforward approach to addressing this problem is to find someone who does have the relevant language skills and involve them as collaborators. <clears throat> and indeed, it works. As I mentioned earlier, in this study, we collaborated with over 60 people to search for literature in 16 different languages. And in this paper on the right, we also found that the systematic literature review by authors with more diverse language background actually searched for papers in more languages. Today, science is highly globalized, so finding native speakers of, for example, Spanish, Portuguese, French, or Chinese is not that actually difficult. And this also highlights the importance of developing culturally diverse environments in academia. We need a diverse range of people in order to make the best use of knowledge that is available from around the world. 
But of course, finding native speakers of the language of focus can be a challenge as well for many people. So we normally start by asking our colleagues and members of our institute. And we also often uh, recruit collaborators on social media like Twitter and on our project website as well, as you can see in, this, in these examples. And once you establish a network of collaborators, it becomes actually even easier to find relevant collaborators for a new project. And we also require our collaborators to have not only the relevant language skills, but also some discipline knowledge. So they would normally need to be at least undertaking or have a bachelor's degree, but will often have higher research degrees like master's or PhD in a relevant discipline. This is to make sure that they can fully understand the studies being screened and assess their relevance during screening. And I also want to stress the critical importance of agreeing beforehand on how to reward those collaborators. I would strongly suggest offering co-authorship to your collaborators as their skills and knowledge are essential for effective and, and successful synthesis of evidence across languages. <clears throat> Talking of recruiting collaborators, as you might know, there's a really cool platform in healthcare called the Cochrane Engage, where you can post some translation tasks to recruit volunteers or collaborators. For example, someone has just recently posted this task to translate a Japanese language article they found into English. So developing this kind of centralized system could be much, much more effective than individual researchers recruiting collaborators independently. So we should definitely consider developing this kind of uh, platform in other disciplines as well. Going back to our collaboration process, after successfully recruiting the necessary collaborators, it is extremely important to ensure that everyone in the project has a common understanding of the purposes and methods of the project. Providing a clear guidance to the collaborators is especially important when synthesizing literature in a wide range of languages because the project will involve a vast number of collaborators with diverse cultural and linguistic backgrounds so it is quite often difficult to achieve the consensus of uh, objectives and approaches. So we normally prepare multiple documents that explain the objectives and processes of the searches, including the full criteria for selecting eligible studies during the searches. We also provide these documents in a relevant no English language if needed, uh, like this example of a Spanish version. We then ask every collaborator to read and understand those documents before starting the searches. <clears throat> and training collaborators is another important process. We, we, for, the, for that paper, we asked all collaborators to conduct a set of a, a test study screening where they were requested to read the metadata of 51 English language papers which included a total of 14 eligible studies, decide if each study was eligible or not, and provide a full reasoning for their decisions. Then the outcome of the test screening was examined by the core team members who provided uh, collaborators with further uh, feedback. Okay, uh, so that's basically how we developed our collaboration with native speakers of the relevant languages in our project. The next step is, finally, to actually conduct the searches for no English language literature. And the method we used is called discipline-wide literature searching. We adopted this approach rather than the uh, systematic reviewing using the keyword searches. And this approach does not depend on search term choice and can identify novel conservation interventions that would not necessarily have been identified on the basis of predetermined search terms. For this, we first identified no English language peer-reviewed journals in the relevant disciplines, ecology and biodiversity conservation. We asked each collaborator to use a wide range of approaches, such as using personal knowledge, opinions from colleagues, local literature databases, web searches, and so on, 
to identify as many potentially relevant journals as possible. So this led to the creation of a list of 466 peer-reviewed non-English language, non -English language journals in ecology and conservation, which is also available on our website here. And all journals identified were then grouped into three categories, very relevant, relevant, and maybe relevant. The following search is then aimed to at least cover all journals categorized as very relevant, and when possible, those in the other two categories. <clears throat> Next, we screened every single paper published in as many issues of those journals as possible, more specifically, either to the earliest volume published or going back at least 10 years for longer running journals. In the end, we screened about 420,000 peer reviewed papers in 326 journals published in 16 different languages. We then identified relevant papers using predetermined eligibility criteria. And by this time, our collaborators had already familiarized th themselves with the eligibility criteria by reading the guidance documents and going through the training. And the final step is to extract and record data using a template file. And all these processes were first done by each collaborator who is a native speaker of the target language and the validity of the studies included was assessed by our uh, core team members using the extracted data as well as also based on uh, discussions with the collaborators. So I would say all these processes were extremely interactive and we spent much, much time closely and repeatedly communicating with the collaborators for each language. So this is a really time consuming process. So this was basically our search strategies in the paper of focus today. But we can also conduct keyword searches for non-English language literature using literature search systems, which is the standard approach for system literature reviews and maps. In this case, using an appropriate literature search system would be cr critically important. We can, of course, use Google Scholar, which covers pretty much every language, but as is also very known for English language studies, different search systems may not necessarily return the same literature, even when using the same keywords. This figure on the right shows the number of papers searched using the same keywords on different systems. And as you can see in Japanese and Russian here, local literature search systems shown in pink returned much, much more papers than Google Scholar uh, showing green here. So we should search for no English language literature on Google Scholar, but also on at least one local literature search system. So this paper on the left provides a list of such language specific literature search systems. For example, CIRO for Spanish and Portuguese, CNKI for Chinese, and JSTAGE for Japanese. So if you're interested, please have a look at this paper as well. When using literature search systems in multiple languages, translating such strings is another challenge as translating, tr translating terms, especially scientific terms, is quite often much, much more complicated than you'd imagine. For example, in my discipline, we often use biodiversity as a keyword but biodiversity in German, I believe, can be any of these three terms. But please correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I'm not familiar with German. So in this case, we obviously need to include all three rather than just one in the search strings when searching for German language papers. For other terms, especially ones that have been created recently, we may not be even able to find an appropriate translation like this example of evidence-based conservation, for which I can't really find a single formal translation in Japanese. In such a case, we need to think about a set of keywords that collectively represent the concept of evidence-based conservation in Japanese. So again, we need to clearly explain all these potential issues to the collaborators for example, in the form of clear guidance, as we did in this study on the right, 
and closely communicate with each collaborator to make sure that the search strings are correctly, correctly translated into each language. <clears throat> in that sense, it would be useful to establish multilingual nomenclature in each topic or discipline. For example, in our discipline, we study species. So the name of species is quite often used as a keyword in literature searches. Of course, we have scientific names in Latin, which are common across any countries, but people often use uh, common names in local languages, which actually complicates things when searching for literature in multiple languages. To address this kind of problem, the International Onisological Congress has been developing and updating a multilingual list of bird species names, as you can see here. So I believe that establishing such multilingual nomenclature and publishing it and making it accessible is also important in other disciplines too. The most common question I seem to get when I talk about language barriers these days is uh, whether AI can help us overcome language barriers or not. And I'll say my answer is certainly yes, but with some caution. So today, many AI tools are emerging, and some of them, such as ChatGPT and DeepL, can be a powerful tool for synthesizing non-English language literature. For example, even if you don't understand the language, you may be able to use machine translation to manually identify and screen literature in the target language. And you can do the same when extracting data from each literature. We can also develop and use language-specific or cross-language text classifiers or even large language models to automate the identification and screening of literature as well as data extraction. These are all promising approaches, but the problem is that no one has ever tested the validity of these AI tools for searching for non-English language literature in science. Many studies are now emerging, but most studies are focusing on English language studies. In the worst case, errors at each stage of evidence synthesis may accumulate, potentially causing serious bias in the outcomes. That's why we are now working on the validation of these approaches, and hopefully we will be able to publish some results in the near future. But yeah, so that basically concludes my talk today, but here's a list of some take-home messages. First, never assume all important information can be found in English, because that is not true, as we have been discussing today. Second, develop a culturally diverse team to make the best use of knowledge that is available from around the world. Third, use and reward collaborators' language skills and knowledge on local literature, for example, in the form of co-authorship. Also make sure to provide clear guidance and training for collaborators. It is also extremely important to communicate well, really well, throughout the project and establish multilingual nomenclature. Finally, we need to explore and test the effective use of AI tools in multilingual evidence synthesis. And last but not least, I'd like to thank all the collaborators of our Translate project. It's over 100 people now for the huge, truly huge contribution to our project. We are working on many other exciting research and solutions and language barriers in science. So please do visit our website. website. This is our group's website. And if you are interested, contact, contact us anytime. Let's work together to solve this important challenge in science. Thanks so much for the for listening. Thank you.